Hello, and welcome to Industry Talks with Fortech. Okay, we're talking about drones, the use of drones in forest industry. Yeah, and today we got Victor on the podcast. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> so, Victor, you want to just introduce yourself? Uh, Victor Fulbert. Uh, I've been working with Fortech now since past July, so July 2020, I guess, officially started. Uh, I've been working in the forest industry since my graduation in 07 from uh, Nate out of Edmonton. So that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, project manager currently with Fortech and have been using my drone on site doing different quality checks and different little videos here and there to, uh, to just explore and see how well it's going to work for us and continue throughout the industry. So I'm going to be 100% straight up. But I don't know a ton about drones. Um, I had a drone once and I crashed it into a tree and hasn't worked uh, since. But uh, Yeah, they're not meant to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I do have some questions for you, Victor. I just wanted to introduce our audience a bit more about drones and uh, the applications for them in forestry, as well as other applications in, in industry alone. So I guess, what are they used for? What What's uh, your experience? What are some of the practical, uh, most common uses? What are some of the more specialized uses in industry, in the forest industry, forestry and environmental industry? Uh, we, there's so many different applications for them. They've just kind of exploded since they really came on scene. Would have been about five years ago, they really kind of took off and became more available to everybody. Uh, myself, I run a um, Mavic uh, Air 2, which is one of the smaller style drones. So it doesn't have the huge flight time that some of the bigger ones do, but you can still be able to uh, run missions and, and run programs through cup blocks and you can do cup block surveying with them. Um, you can down pretty good enough resolution that you can actually see the browser marks on a lot of the tracks on the machines, which is actually really cool when you think about uh, kind of what you're getting. So you get a lot of real time feedback. You don't have to wait for the satellite images to come in or you to go fly those blocks. Um, and then they have to photo interpret all and all those kind of things you can get real time feedback on. So it's definitely a huge bonus to them. We've got uh, a couple of usage, obviously. We've got uh, pre pre harvest is one of those things that you can do as well. Um, so you can go out and, and fly over top of the standing trees see what your species composition mix is, um, identify any potential trouble zones, because a lot of the time you can figure that out um, just by your, how your tree species composition plays out if you're in a pine cup block and all of a sudden you come across a black spruce stand. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different applications. Um, you can look at construction is really pushing along as well, being able to um, see how that, uh, how your project is moving over time. Uh, whether it's from just the initial development phase all the way through to your final project, uh, being able to stage it and see it and be able to send that off to somebody else and say, you know, here's how the project is going and doing that on a fairly regular basis. You could do it every day, every week, um, whatever your timelines want to be on. And that's one of the things that's awesome about these more compact is if you're willing to put them up over site, feel free to do it and you can, you can do those kind of things. Um, Agriculture is using it to check out their their crop composition, finding areas that uh, their crop maybe isn't doing so well, drought areas or areas of um, that are just weaker than everywhere else. Um, you know, a lot of the time these farmers they actually know their field quite well, so they can usually pick it out long before that. But now they're actually getting data to to be able to say, yeah, this is exactly where my issues are. So maybe it's thrown in an extra irrigation line. Like these are the things that they just expound from there and just continue into so many different facets, not just forestry, but everywhere. Yeah. Tons of data. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The ability to collect data off of just a photo um, through so many third party apps is just, it's amazing what they are gathering. So what, so what other kind of things can you do like with like uh, software or the footage right away? Like say I go and fly my drone. Okay. Now the drone's done. What, what do I do with, with that data, how do I bring it onto the computer, interpret it? Uh, sometimes it takes a lot of 
personal understanding of it sometimes to understand to see what a physical photo is telling you. Uh, but through the third party apps, they have the ability to uh, basically process that data and start getting um, heights off of it. You can see contours on the ground, um, all these different kind of things start to show up. So you can actually, you know, post harvest, you'd have the ability to see where all your drainages go mm -hmm. and actually map off of that and make sure that your roads in the right location. Uh, I was actually talking to a contractor, um, south of where I live, which um, is in West Central Alberta. And so he's a little bit further south than me, but he's a road builder. And so he was looking at the potential of, you know, how much dirt am I actually moving on site so that I can capture it to make sure that I put it back. And, you know, looking at those kind of things right. and, and figuring out your top flow maneuvering. Oh, that's um, cool. And we were, yeah, we were talking about even the, the pre-harvest phase of understanding where those drainages actually are. Mm -hmm. pre-identifying that and seeing what he may need to do, how much dirt he's going to have to move to get to that location as well as, um, as well as afterwards to put it all back. So, you know, there's a lot of little things that come out of it. Um, so having that before and after. Um, yeah. So those are always really good. So, um, drone deploy is one of those, um, third party apps that are really good at that. Uh, being able to identify that, uh, PIX 4D is another one that I've been exploring personally myself. Um, just to kind of understand some of the limitations and differences between the two. And right now it seems like a lot of it's just the actual interface to it, but the data that comes out of it is quite similar. Uh, there's another um, another one that I'm looking at right now as well, which is a little bit newer on the market. It's the uh, DJI, DJI Terra. Um, so that's a, a newer one. And so as these new drones start coming out, there's more and more applications that are um, mm -hmm. applicable. They all, I look at the same data does anyone have and, that lidar have a lidar uh bit on it uh they all can interface with the lidar uh seems like right. the dji terra is the one that might be the easiest interface with it um, but the pix 4d definitely uh they're they're probably pushing the envelope on it they've got a whole bunch of webinars actually coming up so a little bit of free advertising for them i guess cool. <laughs> not as <well. laughs> do the do dad thing um yeah, so they've got uh, they've got a bunch of webinars um, to kind of show how they're advancing through this. So depending on what kind of drone you have and the ability of the photos that it has to be able to capture, um, can pull that. So there's drones that are specific to just pulling lidar lidar data. Um, others that are more specific to photogrammetry. Uh, but yeah, so it just depends on what you're actually after. Brian, I see your your uh, your mind's turning on ideas. How to use this already? What <laughs> what are some things that you can see using right away applicable? You're muted right now. Well, right off the bat, we're already use, using it for like quality control, so uh, pile burning, um, flying blocks, being able to see, uh, check in on the crews, and and make sure that the percentage of burn is there and things like that. So we've been utilizing it internal. I think. Uh, uh, for like thinning projects and things like that, m monitoring the the blocks flying over, you can yeah. check densities and things like that from the air. Look for problem areas. Um, so, uh, definitely quality control. Um, I know guys in the industry they're using it for scouting access, so throwing it up on a kind of a grown in line and just seeing exactly what it looks like. Um, yeah, I can say tons of time. Yeah, some 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 uh, other things that I've seen it utilized for so far is is uh like calculating log um volumes in the in the mill so doing a calculation by putting it on a pattern and and it, it calculating the the volume mm -hmm. uh yeah, there, there is one downside to that one and that's trying to figure out the airspace in it oh yeah so that's one um with a lot of the volume it's based on like a gravel pile or something like that where there's no real airspace to it yeah. Whereas logs, you naturally have airspace. So that is one challenge with it, but it is definitely usable for that. You just need to I would say, some I would conversions. Say, I would say pr private land, like uh, guys that are looking at, at purchasing timber, figuring out percentage of, of aspen versus conifer, especially in leaf off scenarios. Um, in, in any cut block, really, any, any logging operation like that, it could be very useful for a, for a bird's eye view of, of the operations. A few questions I had, Victor, is what certifications are required and, and what are the restrictions around utilizing drones? I know that there's 
um, definitely restrictions and there's cert certifications as well. So maybe if you could touch on those two topics. Uh, so the certification is always evolving. Uh, it's just like one of those, any other legislated stuff, there's always changes that happen, modifications based on um, what people are using it for and how they're, how they're using it. Uh, what it is, is a certification that actually comes from Transport Canada, which means that the certification is usable nationwide. Uh, so currently there's two levels. One is a basic, um, basic certificate, certificate, and then the other one is the advanced certificate. And the difference is, is one is used primarily for, um, for just recreational use is one of the main ones. Um, and for a lot of the work that we do kind of out in the forest, not in heavy populated areas or over top of a lot of people, uh, that's where the basic operations one, you know, kind of that's where it's more suited. Uh, as soon as you start doing stuff that gets into longer distances away from where your pilot is without having uh, somebody else to observe it, then you start needing to look at uh, definitely into the advanced. And then there's actually a new piece that they're coming out with as well, uh, where it's allowing certification beyond line of sight. Um, so that one's kind of cool to be exploring that and, and understanding that not everybody is just flying a 200 meter perimeter around themselves because you have to be able to try and see the drone as, as often as you can. And you're supposed to have visual line of sight of it at all times. And if it's not the pilot, then it, uh, you need an observer to actually see the drone. It's not good enough just to be able to look at the screen and, and go as far as the certification is concerned. Yeah. Having uh, that 200 meters seems like it's pretty limiting on what we actually want to use it for in forestry. That's right. Yeah. There's a lot of times that, you know, I may, may go for a walk into the cup block, stand in the middle of the cup block and then have it fly around me as I kind of progress through it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there's always that kind of stuff. There's also the documentation that goes with everything for it. So, you know, you may only spend 10, 15 minutes up in the air with the drone, but there's going to be at least half hour of paperwork that kind of goes with it to document post-flight, um, pre-flight checks, all those kind of things that need to go with it. So, wow. When you look at it, um, a lot of the information comes in as you're basically a step down from a natural pilot, like a helicopter pilot right. or an aviation pilot. You're you're basically um, a couple steps back from that. And the biggest difference is just the hours and how you collect hours. Wow, so, that's crazy. I never realized there was that much paperwork involved. <laughs> yeah, crazy. it's there's a lot of, it's really nice. There's a lot of guys that have actually put um, apps together to collect this data. Mm. So like I've got two or three different apps on my phone that I use um, prior to flight and to collect the data that I need to be able to do site surveys, to do all the pre-checks rather than me creating my own and then potentially missing something. But I have the ability to add stuff as needed for these as well. So it's kind of nice. So then obviously the post-flight checks and making sure that you're, you know, shutting everything down, making sure that your flight actually like was a success because those things are tracked as well. So. Um, yeah, that LiDAR, it's really cool. Like I've seen some of the apps make the canopy height and get like a 3D image of the forest. So that's pretty cool stuff. Like, I don't know how accurate it is right now, but just having that, it's kind of cool to see that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one that I want to be able to try and use it for is um, definitely looking at uh, permanent sample plots mm -hmm. is one of those applications that I think it would really uh, be, a, be a benefit to to our clients is they typically have the AVI data, which is collected once every 20 years for those sites. But every five years they go and do the measurements on them, but they never get a, um, a above, they don't get pictures above canopy of these sites without somebody having the ability to go over top and do that. Right. So it's just another, another way to be able to monitor and see your stand. And if you get a wind event or something that comes through and takes out part of that PSP, well, now you actually have documentation to say right. when it actually happened by the time you go back and measure mm. it again. Or yeah. you want to go back and be like, hey, I want to see what my stand was doing, you know, 10 years ago. Well, if you've, you're collecting data from all these different types, it, it just starts to paint a much better picture. Yeah. So. I imagine you can probably get a bigger sample sample area too than the typical yeah, PSP. Yeah, you get a much wider range of it. And mm -hmm. um, I think the available data would be a lot greater. I've got a few cons and a few pros written down. So I have uh, definitely some of the cons are just the, the certifications that are required and, and the restrictions around operating them. Um, so those are some of the cons that I've gotten. 
Uh, some of the pros, obviously, is it can speed up uh, data capture um, compared to manually doing different types of data. It can give you additional data that you would normally never get. Um, I think another benefit is if you're thinking about uh, helicopter costs versus a drone cost, assuming that it's something that a drone can do, um, cost difference is going to be quite substantial, right? Yeah, the drone will cover the cost in one hour. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm actually just running, understanding the cost of what it takes to actually put a drone up. And for sure, it's one of those things of, you know, an hour of helicopter time. At minimum, you look at, um, for most of the smaller ones, are somewhere between thirteen to 1500 an hour, depending on, you know, where they're actually located and, and those kind of things. Whereas a drone, um, you know, you'd be looking at you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks on the low end would be what it is. The, high, the larger drones can probably run you a little bit higher, but it's one of those things of the amount of data you can actually capture that is a longer term thing versus a helicopter trying to capture the same data. Um, it's not, I don't see the parallel right now. I haven't been able to quantify the two on the same level. Um, there's benefits to helicopter. Obviously, he's going to be able to get a lot further in a day um, than what a drone can, but the amount of data you can collect, I think, is a lot greater with the drone. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That uh, covered off a lot of my questions. So, I guess, what do you see as, what do you see as, as uh, holding up industry for moving forward with more drone use, specifically in the forest industry? Uh, I think it's just the it's the understanding of what it, there's a ton of guys that are actually out there pushing um, the legislation to be able to allow this. And that's usually what it is. It's the verifiable data that comes off of it. Um, they haven't been able to prove it with, you know, 100% accuracy yet. So um, there's a uh, researcher out of the U of A uh, that works with, um, government Alberta uh, quite a bit. Um, Barry White, I believe is his name. Anyway, he did some research on uh, some establishment surveys with drone usage and basically walk the block with the typical ground survey and then put the drone up into the exact same locations. And they actually just published his paper and I was just trying to find it. I know it got published here. Um, but anyway, there was a lot of um, correlations and what they were finding was their data was obviously going to be more accurate but they were finding that um, with the programming that they were able to do on it to be able to identify the trees, um, it came, what it sounds like it came down to was it had no problem identifying the conifer and actually been able to differentiate the species of conifer through that, but it came down to the deciduous types. So you're, uh, so when you've got lots of alder, lots of willow, but even your black poplar, um, white, or your, your birches that are in the blocks, as well as your, uh, your trembling aspen, those are the ones that typically cause the problems on the species identification. They knew it was there, but they it had a harder time um, deciding what it was. So that was the only kind of downside to it. So you still need to do a little bit of ground interpretation. But when you're looking at kind of your stem counts, it was, it was pretty much bang on. It was within the percent error. So like that's, that's a huge step forward. It's a huge leap. Cool. What about uh, other things besides inventory? What about like, um, like you were talking earlier about um, like uh, water erosion and um, water courses? And is that, what, is there anything holding that up right now on any applications on that? Um, not knowingly. Uh, I know I've used them before in the past to do um, stream crossing monitoring. Like, so I'd, I'd go out and um, after, after roads were reclaimed, you go out and put the drone up to capture photos uh, to show the reclamation. And uh, it's really, it's a very different perspective because you can actually get above and see the channel from both sides of it rather than trying to be down and stand in the channel and trying to get across. You don't always get a, the same perspective. So that's definitely one of those things that um, helps to confirm um, mm -hmm. how, that, how that reclamation went. Uh, same thing with blowouts or anything like that. You could do the same thing. I know that there was, um, can't remember where, there's a huge landslide. I think it was in uh, in California. And they threw 
like hundreds of drone hours at it to be able to map it so that they could figure out exactly what happened. And it was one of those um, opportunities that just showed here's the data that was coming off of it. And they're still sorting through what, what uh, the full implications are, mm-hmm. but being able to understand it and, and capture it more than just a helicopter. They're trying to video the thing and then trying to interpret off that video. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things that can work for that. I know I've gone through and um, basically captured the data post harvest to um, enforce the skid clear. So that you can actually use that as potential evidence to say, here's what it is. Here's what we had um, after harvest. And then you do the same thing after site prep has gone in and you can see kind of the differences of um, where the tracking was for the site prep, see how accurate it was, right. but also ground rutting. Um, trees left behind pockets of the block that were not completed. Like there's so many different little things that kind of come with just collecting photo data without having to actually put your feet in every inch of the, of a cut block yeah. or in every inch of ground. Right. So yeah, there's a lot of different little things that come with it, I guess that you just kind of take for granted. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there'll be a whole new fields too of study based off of that. Yeah. Yeah, the one that I think was really, really beneficial was you could actually do measurements on how much ground disturbance you had for like your road, your road disturbance right. within a cut block, rather than always just saying, oh, yeah, the road is five meters wide. Well, no, you can actually measure and say, yeah, it's five and a half here. Right. My ditches were another half meter or I didn't build any ditches here and I only built a four meter road because that's all I needed. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot easier to quantify those kind of things. And that's that's pretty big. Um, I think that that's huge data that uh, can go to to better build. Um, so why is that DFMPs for? Sorry. Right. Why is, why is that better than uh, imagery? Like just getting satellite imagery. Uh, the imagery isn't always up to date, and a lot of the time when the reclamation's been completed, so it's a lot harder to see the true road surface. But if you're doing it like post um, post harvest. Even if you did it immediately after the reclamation, right, right there. The post reclamation okay. check, it's right there. You can mm-hmm. see it a lot easier. You don't have any green opening in the block. So all these little things in the timing is what makes the biggest difference with, I think, the drone application versus waiting for, you know, the the air photo plane to go over and and do his flights potentially two years later in right. some cases. All of that kind of helps. Um, quantify your DFMP just a little bit more and saying, yes, these are the things that I'm actually doing, or, hey, here's the things that we're actually doing better than what we set as our targets. I was just saying, Victor, um, you answered all the questions that I had and uh, appreciate you hopping on tonight. And uh, yeah, hopefully our viewers got something out of this. And uh, I look forward to seeing what goes on in the future in, in the forest industry and forestry environment. Of Western Canada with uh, with drone applications and drone use, so it'll be yeah. it'll be interesting to see, and hopefully we can be a part of that. Yeah, I know it'd be huge to be able to be a part of that. Awesome! All right, the next time. <laughs>